down from a broken sky, traced out by the city lights. My world from a mile high, best seat in the house tonight. Touchdown on the cold black top. So, I'm excited this morning to talk to you guys about something that I feel like I've been learning over the past year or so. Let me pull up the first slide and see if we're working. All right. If I sit here, can you guys see? This is your chance to voice yes. complaints. No, David? Yes? Okay. All right. So here's a, a quick Joan Osborne quote to get us started. It's easy to answer the ultimate questions. It saves you bothering with the immediate ones. Um, and so as I was thinking through this talk and, and kind of where we're heading in the next few minutes, uh, this is sort of where the rubber meets the road as far as what it means to follow Jesus. Now, for the past seven, eight weeks, Don's been taking us through a series of following what it looks like to follow after Jesus. And uh, ultimately, if, if we get really caught up in the ultimate questions of the big scope of life, sometimes we miss the immediate things that are right in front of us. And so Scripture is pretty clear that if we can answer the big questions correctly, but it doesn't impact the way that we treat other people, then it's sort of bankrupt. We're wasting our time. We're basically just uh, great scholars, but not, uh, not great at applying what we know. So I wanted to take a look this morning together as a group, and there will be times this morning where you're going to need to kind of be in clusters to talk with other people and discuss opinions and thoughts. So if you are on an island, you might need to move towards somebody that you don't mind speaking to for a few minutes. So you will be discussing things and reporting back a little bit as we walk through this together. Um, so I want to look, just to give you an idea of where we're heading, at, at two different things here. So uh, we can look at what it means to love others well, to be focused on others, in kind of two big categories is what we're going to look at this morning. One is in moments, so in small things. So this is an immediate need, something that you can just step in once and do, and then it's done. And maybe there's people that come to your mind right now, people that do that really well, that they just seem to have a radar for, for people's needs and they can step in and help in a specific situation. So I think that's one type of being focused on other people, giving our lives away to other people. And then the other type of it, I think, is a much bigger, broader idea about movement. So it's the idea of what's the movement of your, gen of your whole life in general? What are you moving towards? Is it giving more and more of your time and your life away to other people. Uh, so these two things are probably correlated, being, being aware of how to serve in small, immediate things. But then also, have we gone through the process of asking, am I giving my life away to something bigger? Uh, the next 10, 20, 30 years, not just the next 10 seconds. So we're going to walk through that together this morning and look at those two different dynamics. And like I said, you guys will be putting on your detective's hats, and helping me sift through this as we go through. So let me pray, and then we will read an old classic Sunday school story together and then pull it apart. So let me pray. God, would you make us aware of places in our lives that we can surrender to you? God, would you help us to take the things we might learn here this morning and not just tuck them away in our brains to sound really smart and share uh, with other people later, God, but that they would affect the way that we live our lives, that we would start applying and practical steps, God's, God, the things that, uh, that you're teaching to us this morning. In your name, amen. All right, so classic Sunday school story. I'm going to step this way to read it. Luke 10. So I'll read this, and uh, you can just follow along in the screen. And this is from the message, so it's a little more laissez-faire in its uh, interpretation. Just then, a religion scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life. He answered, what's written in God's law, how do you interpret it? He said that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence, and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, said Jesus. Do it, and you'll live. Looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define neighbor? Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan, traveling the road, came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. 
He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religion scholar responded. Jesus said, Go and do the same. So, here's the first question that you're going to discuss with your neighbors. Based upon past Sunday school experiences you've had or messages you've heard on this, I want you guys to discuss these questions. Why did the Samaritan stop and why didn't the others? So just going out of the passage or maybe things you've learned through the years, collectively pool your knowledge in your team. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do this, but we have like maybe a group here and one there. I don't know. We'll figure this out. But find somebody to talk to about these two questions. You have one to two minutes, depending on how awkward the silence is. So, go. All right, so what are some thoughts that came up in groups? And just so you know, I'm not a big fan of leading questions. Like, uh, did you ever experience this in school where you have like the blank to fill in and you would raise your hand and say something that may even be correct, but it's not what they wanted in the blank and you were told you were wrong? Did you guys experience that? I'm not a fan of that. So don't, uh, there isn't a specific, like, I don't have a list of things that I'm going to, like, say, no, that's wrong or that's right. So feel free to throw out ideas. So what are, what are some, just speculating on the story from what we know of being human beings, from what we might know from culture at that time or whatever, what, what are some reasons that you think the Samaritan stopped or that the other guys didn't? Okay. Yeah, one of the things, and maybe, did anybody else have something along that idea of the, the guy on the ground was unaccessible to them? Did anybody talk about that at all? One of the things that, that uh, at that time, so Jesus lists these two religious leaders, and, uh, and one of the, the customs, if it had been a Sabbath day when he told the story, is they can't come in contact with anything that's dead. And so if the man who's beaten almost to death laying on the ground they felt that they would themselves be unclean, maybe, if they went over just to inspect. And so their concern for making sure that they were holy kept them from investigating the scenario. That's one thought on the story that maybe Jesus was trying to imply. But yeah, that the man was, uh, even if he was a Jew or whoever he was, but the state in which he was in, they didn't feel the freedom to go and help potentially is, is something that I've heard on that before, yeah. Other thoughts, other ideas? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we can speculate that maybe he had been in a similar position before, or whatever his background looked like. Yeah. Yeah. So again, his past experience may have uh, made him more aware uh, to step forward. Okay. Okay. Maybe he had a good mom, right? Yeah. So he just did. Okay. Okay. So you actually put it into action. Maybe it was out of a spiritual background or a conviction or belief or just being a good person, what he thought it meant to be a good person. Uh, other things, why do you, why do you outside of uh, the religious fears, why, what are other reasons you think that maybe the guys didn't stop in this story? Yeah. Okay. So concern for themselves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they had things to do, maybe? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. There's some kind of spiritual conference to go to. 
Yeah. Yes. Late for church. Yeah. Yeah, Leah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, they've actually done, and this is really disturbing, but they've done studies that you are more likely to receive help if you, um, let's say you're out here on one of the back roads and your car broke down or you were injured, you're running or whatever, you get injured. You're most likely to receive help if it's some sort of desolate space because the individual that comes past feels more of a responsibility if they know, oh, I might be the only person here in the next 20 minutes. They've actually done studies where they've had like uh, elderly women fake um, some sort of leg injury in a major city, and they will sit on the sidewalk for 20, 30, 40 minutes before, before people will stop because there's such a group mentality of somebody else will probably get that or somebody else knows the situation. So there's we defer. Someone else might take care of this or someone else will do it. So we have that hesitancy maybe, and then if we can come up with an excuse about how it's someone else, someone else who has more time or knows what's going on we'll take care of it so uh, the other interesting part about this story is Jesus is making uh, a lot of radical controversial statements in this story so uh, to uh, to the audience that he's telling this to these these Jewish religious scholars when he sets up the scene about this man who's been injured and then he says um, hey you know the the first character that comes in is this religious leader and uh, this priest and then the second one's this Levite he's He's basically, these first two guys are the, uh, in that culture, the people that would have been the heroes, that you would expect to step in and do something. So I was thinking of how do we contextualize this today. This would be like um, a UK fan is injured and John Calipari comes down the road, right? <laughs> but, and he just walks past. Um, and then uh, I was trying to think of, you know, who else you could pull? Julius Randle walks past on the other side, but then a Louisville fan comes and cleans him up. He's making a very controversial statement. If we want to make it even more disturbing, because the Samaritan in that culture, uh, they were seen, uh, for, any, for any Harry Potter fans, they were mudbloods. They were half-breeds. So they, uh, the Samaritan race emerged out of a group of Jews that intermarried with other races and then uh, were looked at. So people who, who were pure-bloods, uh, 100% Jewish, viewed Samaria, uh, the, the, the region of Samaria and the Samaritans with a, a sense of disdain, kind of turning their nose, noses up towards them. In fact, they would walk around Samaria instead of going through it, even though it would be faster, just because they didn't want to associate. So, uh, so when Jesus at the end says, the Samaritan's coming, this would be the villain in the story. Everybody would expect that guy to pass by, but he doesn't. He's the one that becomes the, the hero or the model in the story. If we want to make it more disturbing, I was thinking about it would be like saying a U.S. citizen's injured and a priest or a pastor walks by and uh, a U.S. soldier walks by, but a member of the Taliban stops and helps him. Like, this is the controversial nature in which they would not have been happy with this story because the, the people they viewed as enemies and outcasts, Jesus now just made him the hero. So which one would you say is his neighbor? Oh, the guy at the end. We'll go do that instead. So it's a pretty controversial story. Um, which leads me to another question. So we can look and speculate about maybe this guy's background, why did he stop, what are all the things at play. Uh, but the next question I have, which you're going to discuss and just throw out some opinions, is, is having compassion, a compassionate response, something that happens naturally, or is it a discipline or a choice? So is it something that internally it happens naturally, or is it something that you uh, have to mentally decide to do? Is it a choice? So regroup, take another couple minutes, and throw out your opinions to each other. Go. So what are some thoughts? And, and just to let you know, I'm walking you through the questions I had as I was looking at this. So, and then I'm going to take you through some of the stuff I found as we went. But what are your thoughts right now? Is having compassion natural or is it a choice? Yeah. It's a trick question? Okay. It wasn't meant to be. <laughs> Maybe it is. But, but what do you mean? So what do you So maybe it's something we have inherently, but we unlearn it or become cautious. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking through as you're saying that, my three small kids, 
there are times when I think they're naturally compassionate, and then there's other times where they're not. Yeah. So I'll leave out specific stories. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Sure. I think um, as I intended it, sort of one and the same. So actually doing something, not just feeling bad, but actually being that person that would stop. So. Okay. Other thoughts. you're saying it's like developing a muscle like working out the more you use something the easier it's going to become to to do that the more the way just yeah, okay so the you use it or you lose it maybe it's kind of what we were talking about. Just like my multiplication tables from fourth grade. Gone. Okay. Um, well, so as I started studying this and trying to figure out why, why did this guy stop all the speculation, it led me to, this is going to sound strange, but I went to social neuroscience, and I put, it's not rocket surgery, or is it? Um, it's, uh, it's a field in which they, they try to uh, study social interactions linked with what's going on in the human brain as people are interacting with people. So because we have the technology to do this and because we have the free time, we now uh, will study people in social settings while we're monitoring their brains to see what areas of the brain are activating or lighting up, uh, depending on what's going on in conversations, that sort of thing. So uh, a guy named Daniel Goleman was giving one of the, the TED Talks. Have you guys seen the TED, the TED Talks at all? If not, check them out, they're interesting. But he was giving a TED Talk uh, a number of years ago and he was talking about what social neuroscience had found concerning compassion. And so here's the quote on the screen. I'll read it for you. It says, The new thinking about compassion from social neuroscience is that our default wiring is to help. That is to say, if we attend to the other person, we automatically empathize. We automatically feel with them. There are these newly identified neurons, mirror neurons, that act like a neural Wi-Fi, activating in our brain exactly the areas activated and theirs, theirs being the person that's upset. We feel with automatically, which is interesting. So they're saying that there's, uh, whether we want it to happen or not, if we actually see someone that's suffering, that there's a part of our brain that lights up that's very similar to what they're experiencing. So that, that our natural wiring or the, uh, our default wiring is to feel with people, uh, which again leads to the question, well, how come that doesn't happen all the time? Why do people walk past? So if this is our default. Uh, which led me to another study, uh, which I find pretty interesting. In Princeton, uh, several decades ago, they did a study off the, the story that we just read. And this is how they set it up. Um, they uh, would bring a group of students into a room, and they would read through the Good Samaritan story like we just did 15, 20 minutes ago. They'd read through the story, answer a few questions on it, and then they'd say, hey, you need to go across campus to the, this other building, and we're going to have someone interview you and record your thoughts on that. We didn't have the equipment here. We have to go to that special lab or whatever and go there. Uh, and so they did this with a, a, two different sets of students, and uh, they would release them and send them across campus. And on the way, on that path, there was somebody that was in distress. And then they stopped to see who, who would stop and who just kept going. And at the end, they started to see, is there any sort of correlation with why some people stopped and why others didn't. So Princeton did this several decades ago, and then Primetime uh, remade it. Have you seen the little thing of the what would you do scenarios? Uh, this is a clip from that. It's a few minutes long, but it's totally worth it to see how this played out just a couple years ago. So, Jeremy, if we have audio on the computer, 
We'll fire this up. All right. Watching as hidden cameras catch our volunteers approaching actors pretending to be in distress. Even though the volunteers have just heard the parable of the Good Samaritan, we see one person after another stroll on by, offering no help. However... <laughs> You're right there, boys. Sorry? You are right? Need any help? <laughs> Plenty of our volunteers are ready and willing to do something. You all right? Need some help? Yeah. Possibly help some help. You have a phone? Same Good Samaritan story, same actors in distress, but different results. Why? Hey, Pat, I'm John Quinones. This is all part of an experiment. Okay. He's an actor. Daryl here is an actor. <laughs> and we Thank wanted to help. know, would people stop and help? And a lot of people didn't, and you did. Oh, okay. So tell us why. Why? Well, we just got done reading about it, number one. Yeah. You know, here I am going to do something that, you know, to me looks like something's going to be fun and a good time. And I see this poor guy. Looks like he needs help. But there's more to it than that. Carrie Keating says our results mirror the famous 1970s Princeton study on seminary students that our experiment is based on. One thing predicted who stopped and who didn't stop 30 years ago in the original study. And in this study too? And in this study too. And it was time pressure. Time pressure? We have maps for you. Um, so we are right here. Yes. Go out. back to the start when our producer Danielle tells our volunteers how to get to the studio for their supposed screen test. I'm so sorry that I'm rushing you out of here, but I just wanted... Just like the Princeton researchers, she tells half the volunteers they're running late. So good, go. You're in a rush. Hurry. Get up there. I'm going to call and tell them that you're on your way right now. Now they believe that in order to get their big break, a chance to be on ABC TV, they'll have to hurry and it makes a big difference. Most of them fly by the actors in distress. For those in a rush, only about 35% stop to help. For those not rushed, more than 80% do. Is it a sign of whether a person is a good person or not? You know, it's not a difference between good and bad people. Probably any one of us would behave in the same way under time pressure. Most of the research says that we can get anyone to pass by a guy like this if we put enough pressure on. Do you feel bad about not having stopped? Yeah. Almost everyone who doesn't stop mentions being rushed as a reason. You were in a hurry. I was in a hurry, so I should have stopped. But they wanted me to be here right now, so that was my dilemma. I was supposed to be here on time at a place, and I just couldn't, you know, stop. Because I was rushed. I was more anxious to get here. Whatever you are thinking, the right thing to do would be to stop. All right. So let's bring this all back to the Good Samaritan story. Taking what we know now from social neuroscience, from Princeton and primetime experiments. And let's look at this question. At what moment did the Samaritan choose to help? So here is the, the section from the story. As you look through that again, when did he make the decision to help? We'll just guess or throw out some ideas based upon what we just looked at. Okay. Yeah, Lynn? Okay. Yeah. So there's that, that line right at the top. I, I'm, I'm with you guys. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. So, uh, there's this interesting correlation in scripture between the idea of seeing and then feeling. So I went and looked at these two words. So the word saw, when he saw the man, it actually just translates as either A, just to see something, or B, it can mean to, to perceive, to understand, to turn your mind, your heart, your attention towards. And we have the same problem with our word in English still, right? So we could say, hey, do you see that? Which just means... Do you register with your eyes that that's there? Or we ask deeper questions about, do you see me? We're not asking, do you physically see me, but do you see or perceive or understand? So uh, that word is the word ido in scripture. And so ido appears everywhere. And uh, like, again, like I said, it could just be, hey, look at that. Or it could be, do you perceive, do you turn your heart, your attention, your mind towards? The second word, which is more fun to say, the one that says moved with compassion, 
is the word splach needs oh my. So we're going to say it all together, okay? It's like Spock needs oh my. But at the end of Spock, you have to do like a sound. So it's Splock needs oh my. Okay, so we're going to do it on three. Ready? One, two, three. Splock needs oh my. One more time. One, two, three. Splock needs oh my. All right. So you can pull this out at like a really weird party if you want and explain what this is. Because it's a very interesting word. So Splock needs oh my is what we translate moved with compassion or feeling in the heart. But in this culture, in most of, uh, most of the Bible, when it talks about the word that we translate as heart, the seat of the emotion was actually seen as the bowels. And so for us, it's do you have something in your heart? What does your heart feel? Uh, in this culture, it would have been how do you feel in your bowels? Which, uh, which is interesting, but it actually makes a lot of sense. We still use phrases that don't make sense for your heart, but that makes sense for your bowels, right? So we say, like, I was really moved by that talk. Right? <laughs> this is where it comes from. This is where it comes from. We're not talking about your heart. Your heart doesn't move anywhere. But that's where it comes from. So, uh, or the negative term of it, right? The, uh, I'm not moved by that at all. Okay? Or, I don't give a crap. Right? <laughs> Literally, this is where the concept comes from. And I don't know why that doesn't seem strange to us before, but we say those things, right? That we're not moved, that we don't feel something, whatever it is. This is where it comes from, is the idea of being moved in your bowels. So again, tuck away splock needs, oh my. Pull that out at a weird party. But that's, that's where it comes from. So I, I started looking, and almost every time that splock needs, oh my, occurs, it occurs 12 times in Scripture, it's almost always preceded by Ido in the same sentence. So here's a couple other things to look at where it shows up on the screen. So here's the one we just looked at, the Samaritan story. And then uh, here's one from Matthew. So it says, Seeing the people, he felt compassion. This is Jesus. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. So, I doing the people, he splock needs o mide for them. Uh, it says, here's another one in Matthew 14. So when he went ashore, this is Jesus again, he idoed a large crowd and splock needs o mide for them and healed their sick. So he perceived them and then he was moved. He felt it in his heart or bowels, whatever you're more comfortable thinking about. And, uh, and then he did something. All right, another time it shows up, Luke 7. So again, Jesus, when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. So seeing, perceiving, feeling. And then one last one. So this is the uh, prodigal son story where the God figure in the story at the end, this says, this is the father, the God figure. It says, so he got up and came to his father, the son's coming. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, Ido, and splock needs oh my for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. So every time, almost every time that splock needs oh my shows up in scripture, it's preceded by Ido. So which leads to the bigger question, kind of to pull this all together, is are you able to see people? So if it's about being aware, then in some sense, perhaps the Samaritan made the decision to help that man before he ever saw that the man was in trouble, because maybe he had not a busy schedule. Maybe he had a little more time on the road. But we do know that it says that he saw the man, that he perceived him, and then felt something. So I'm, I think it's a safe bet to say that he had the time and, uh, and then he had a different sort of seeing than the other guys did, that he allowed it to move him or feel him, or that he would feel what was going on for that person. So uh, as I was thinking through this in my life, there are some very specific ways in which I make sure that I don't have time to see other people. And I do it, um, so I'm going to confess to you guys here some patterns in my life. Uh, one of them is this great anti, uh, it's like a social bubble you can put yourself in that sits in my pocket. Uh, I can't tell you how many times that if I just don't want to interact in a room, whether it's uh, a public setting, I'm in a waiting room somewhere, or it's at the gathering, it's five minutes before church starts, or whatever it is, where my temptation is to pull out my phone, and sometimes I'll try to find something that looks like I'm, you know, it's important, I'm checking the news or the weather, or I'm whatever it is, something that makes me look busy. But there are other times where um, I literally will be in a room if I just, don't, I just don't want to be aware of what's happening. I would just swipe screens back and forth 
Does anybody else do this? Does anybody else hide in their phone? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So you just hide. Like, I take my eyes literally away from people and put them on the screen and just, I'm here. And it, it says to every socially conscious American, that guy's busy or he's unavailable to approach right now. Right? I mean, if it's, that's, this is sort of a, a way that we can step out of that. Another thing that keeps me from seeing people is routine. So if I drive the same streets every day doing the same thing, I tend to not even pay attention to what's going on around me because I'm mentally somewhere else. I don't have to think anymore about which road I'm turning on. I can almost do that on autopilot and my mind is completely somewhere else. So I'm just stuck in my routine and I'm not even aware maybe of things that are going on outside of my normal pattern of routine. So there are things in my life that, uh, that keep me from being aware and seeing other people. So the thing to combat that, what I've been sort of looking at and studying and figuring out, is this idea of the discipline of margin. And what I mean by that is leaving enough space in your life to be available for what God wants to do. The more I thought about this, every spiritual discipline we have is simply a discipline of margin. Whether that's tithing with finances, it's saying, hey, this much is what I'm going to consume, but it stops here, and then this is what I'm believing. It's, it's extra. I have the freedom to give to things that I want to give to because I've left margin. Uh, it's the whole idea of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a, a community trust saying, hey, we're going to work as hard as we can six days a week, but we're going to trust each other to rest and to leave some space. Uh, it's something I feel like our culture could really benefit from. But, uh, but are we doing a good job of finding ways to factor in some margin, to not be as busy? So the idea here is to plan unplanned time, which seems really counterproductive and non-American or capitalistic. But, but the idea of I'm going to leave space in my schedule where I have nothing there, because something could come up that I need to be available for. So think through your week and your, your patterns, going to work, your lunch break, where you're at. Is there any breathing room in your life where if you needed to change something or be flexible, that it wouldn't just break, it wouldn't snap you in half with, with having to bend over backwards, that, that you have the availability to step into something? Um, all right, so think through that for a minute. Are there things that you could do, small things that you could change that would make you more available for maybe the things that God wants to do and make you aware of. That would actually, you would choose ahead of time to be available to help and not have to choose in that moment because you would have the time to be aware. So moving on from that, we're going to go through this real fast, but the idea of movement. So what are you giving your life to? So there's the micro view of small things, but then can you see your life in the bigger perspective? What, what is the, uh, so not just helping in small situations, but are you patterning your life about giving it away to, to something bigger than you and just daily concerns? And so kind of the big things, if we we're going to chunk our life into some different categories, this doesn't cover all of them, but the big things would be career, comfort, relationships, free time, money. There might be other things that fit outside of that, but that's sort of, if we had to chunk our life into different categories. Almost everything we do falls into one of those, or they, they fall into multiple of those categories. And so uh, there's this idea here of what does it mean? How much of, of this stuff does God want? And so if you've been paying attention at all the past few weeks when, when Don's been, been teaching about following Jesus, this is what Jesus says specifically about these things. We're going to get two passages again in Luke, and he addresses uh, all these things. So he says in Luke 9, uh, on the road, someone asked if he could go along. I'll go with you wherever, he said. And Jesus was curt. Are you ready to rough it? We're not staying in the best inns, you know. Jesus said to another, follow me. He said, certainly. But first, excuse me for a couple days. Please, I have to make arrangements for my father's funeral. Jesus refused. First things first, your business is life, not death. And life is urgent. Announce God's kingdom. Then another said, I'm ready to follow you, master. But first, excuse me while I go and get things straightened out at home. Jesus said, no procrastination, no backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. Luke 14, how fortunate the one who gets to eat dinner in God's kingdom, this guy says to Jesus. Jesus followed up, yes. For there was once a man who threw a great dinner party and invited many. When it was time for dinner, he sent out his servant to the invited guests saying, come on in, the food's on the table. Then they all began to beg off, one after the other making excuses. The first said, 
I bought a piece of property and need to go look it over. Send my regrets. Another said, I just bought five teams of oxen and I really need to check them out, so send my regrets. And yet another said, I just got married and need to get home to my wife. The servant went back and told the master what had happened. He was outraged and told the servant, quickly, get out into the city streets and alleys. Collect all who look like they need a square meal. All the misfits and homeless and wretched you can lay your hands on and bring them here. The servant reported back, Master, I did what you commanded, and there's still room. The master said, Then go to the, count, the country roads. Whoever you find, drag them in. I want my house full. Let me tell you, not one of those originally invited is going to get so much as a bite at my dinner party. Segwin, another section. One day, when large groups of people were walking along with Jesus, or walking along with him, Jesus turned and told them, Anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, Yes, even one's own self can't be my disciple. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. So uh, the bad news is, is that Jesus wants everything. Every, every one of those categories, the, the big things in life, uh, he says, I want all of that. So there, there is no section of our life that we can say, finances are mine, God, you can take care of my kids. Or the kids are mine, God, you can take care of my spouse and fix them for me. Um, that, that all of these things are things that Jesus wants us to hand over to him. And I think it starts with small decisions, like I said, about margin, about carving out some space and choosing to trust God with these things. So what does it mean to give our lives to God's kingdom work? And I think uh, that the religion scholar in Luke 10 wasn't wrong. So back at the Samaritan story that we read, he said, that what it means to, uh, to give our lives to, to his kingdom work is to love God and to love people, which seems like a pretty broad umbrella. But specifically, how do we do that? And I think just a couple practical things as we close out here is to start small. So start one by one. We're talking, I'm not talking about changing the entire world or Lexington or the community at the gathering. Is there one person in your life that you have the time and the availability to give your life to, to love them, to care for them, to serve them. Um, has that thought ever gone through your heart or your mind before that you can create space to be available, that your life matters and is important, and that you can play a role in building God's kingdom work with the people that you're around uh, intentionally and sacrificially, so it's not going to happen on accident. You're going to have to give something up to do this, and it probably will hurt initially, but it's, it's worth it. Um, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So what does it mean to love other people well? It's uh, teaching them what God's heart looks like and that, and that actually following after him is worth it. It's worthwhile. And so this whole idea, the buzzword around it that you've heard Don talk about before is the idea of discipleship, of taking your life and what it looks like for you to try to follow Jesus and inviting someone else into that story and saying, hey, this is what I know. I'm not complete or perfect. I have a lot of issues but let me share with you what God's doing, and let me see if I can help you figure out what it looks like to follow Jesus as well. And so the, one of the best definitions I've heard for discipleship is it's simply friendship with a vision. So friendship, just as friendship, uh, means that we hang out when we really like each other. Um, friendship with a vision is the idea of we hang out, and I'm going to say things that probably will make you not like me on purpose because it's good for you, and it's good for me. And we know that going into it, that, hey, this is something I want to push you towards, and so I might say things that aren't always easy to hear um, because I love you and because I think there's something bigger to give your life to. So I hope that's clear, the two different ideas of how do we help in small things, create space in your life, maybe just in small schedule, routine, um, and then how do, we, how do we give our lives away in a bigger picture is create some space in your life for someone else, another person. Just start with one person. Don't launch into all of, all of Lexington. All right, so... To, uh, to wrap this up here, I want you guys, I'm going to play a song, not me playing, I'm just going to play it over the speakers, and it's actually the one that was on when you guys came in, and I want you to think about one practical thing that you could do, a very tangible thing you could do to create just a little bit of space in your life. So some ideas might be, uh, instead of, I need to leave at 8.50 to get to the office at 9, I'm going to leave at 8.45. I'm going to leave that extra five minutes, so if somebody was on the side of the road, I felt like i got five minutes to stop and see what's going on. So it's just an idea. It's something like that, something that's very practical, measurable. If we had to ask you a week from now, you could say, yes, I did, or no, I didn't do it. Not, 
something abstract, like I want to think about God more. Okay, so take, take the time to think through that as the song plays. Down from a broken sky, traced out by the city lights. My world from a mile high, best seat in the house tonight. Touch down on the cold black top, hold on for the sudden stop. Breathe in the familiar shock of confusion and chaos. All those people going somewhere. Why? As deep cries out 